You are watching a 90-minute presentation entitled The Power Act, The Historical, Present, and Future of Legal Representation of Native American Domestic Violence Victims. This presentation has been approved for 90 minutes of CLE credit in Nebraska and Iowa. Those wanting CLE credit will need to pay a small fee and should email dave at omahabarassociation.com for details and for reporting purposes. This presentation was recorded in early fall 2020 in coordination with the Omaha Bar Association, the Federal Practice Commission, the Commission on Indian Affairs in Nebraska, the speakers and presenters, and Judge Lori Smithcamp of the U.S. District Court for the District of Nebraska. Judge Smithcamp was the 2020-2021 president of the Omaha Bar Association and the inspiration for this course. We mourn Judge Smithcamp's untimely passing and this presentation is dedicated to her. Today's conversation about the Power Act is broken up into four parts, each being an important part of the discussion about legal protections for domestic violence victims in Native American communities. First, we will hear from Mary Catherine Nagel, an attorney with Pipestem Law in Washington, DC, and an enrolled citizen of Cherokee Nation. Ms. Nagel will walk us through the historical landscape of sovereignty on tribal lands and pertaining to tribe members, as well as examining some of the recent court cases that are important in the discussion for protecting Native American domestic violence victims. Next, we will hear from Professor Sarah Deer of the University of Kansas. Professor Deer is a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation and Chief Justice for the Prairie Island Indian Community Court of Appeals. Professor Deer will walk us through, step by step, the Power Act, highlighting the importance of the act's implementation and what it can do to stem the tide of domestic violence and victimization of Native American women. Professor Deer will also emphasize the truly life-saving work pro bono attorneys can have in Native American communities. Our third presenter is Kirby Williams, Domestic Violence Outreach Coordinator of the Native American program at Legal Aid of Nebraska. Ms. Williams is a member of Cherokee Nation. In her presentation, Kirby will move us, move our focus to domestic violence and sexual assault happening in Native American communities within Nebraska and the importance of legal assistance in changing wrongs in that system. Our fourth segment is a panel discussion moderated by Kirby Williams with domestic violence social workers from the Ponca, Santee Sioux, Winnebago, and Omaha tribes. This discussion connects the ground zero workers and staff in a discussion about the federal legislation of the Power Act and what attorneys need to know when providing legal assistance to Native American domestic violence victims. Thanks for watching and we hope you enjoy the show. I bring uh, greetings and welcome to uh, all of you. Uh, as this program was uh, coming together, I had the privilege of working with two of my absolute favorite uh, women friends, Judy Goshkovash and Judge Lori Smithcamp. Um, you know, as we put the program uh, together, uh, there was just this sense of, uh, of justice, uh, of wholeness, uh, of grace, uh, and of history, uh, and how we can learn positively uh, from history. Uh, and I hope that comes through because that describes um, Judge Lori Smithcamp. Uh, she was not just a friend and a colleague of mine, but she was a person of uh, uh, grace uh, and elegance and justice. Uh, and quite honestly, she was just the nicest person uh, that I've ever known. So uh, this program is uh, dedicated to you, to her, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Mary Catherine Nagel, and I am coming to you today from Northern Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C., but I was originally born in Oklahoma City. I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, and I was incredibly blessed and honored to have clerked for Judge Lori Smith Camp um, immediately following my graduation from law school. That was my very first job, and I can't say enough about how much clerking for her changed my life, uh, changed my entire career, and um, significantly impacted who I am today. She's greatly missed and uh, left us all too soon. And the federal courts will be a different place without her. I, it would be difficult to name another federal judge with as much integrity and professionalism and bravery and intelligence as Judge Laurie Smith Camp. So um, just wanted to share that brief note. I know many of us are still in shock from the news and she is the reason I'm speaking to you right now. She invited me. She said, we've, we've got to have this CLE on the Power Act and Mary Catherine, would you please come and speak? And um, so I do have an actual PowerPoint that I prepared before we got the horrible news, but um, out of my love and respect for her, and I will watch the time because I know we have time limits, but I wanted to start off by sharing, um, by sharing just a little bit about my memories of Judge Smith Camp. So I'm going to share my screen. This is where we, we wonder if I <laughs> do lawyers and playwrights know how to use technology. Here we go. Okay, oops, but we're not on the first slide. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> oh no, this is where I have to figure out how to do the actual show. Um, let's see, slideshow, play from start. Okay, here we go, great. So um, this is my presentation on the Power Act. Judge Lori Smith Camp specifically asked me to discuss the Power Act, but more specifically, she asked me to sort of repeat a presentation. She was such an incredible supporter and uh, would oftentimes travel to different cities to see my plays or to hear me speak. Um, and I have to be very clear that uh, she inspired me to, to to see justice in a, in, a, in a certain way, I think in the right lens because of the ways in which she viewed the world. And, and again, clerking for her was such an incredibly formative experience. But she's asked me to speak about specifically um, Supreme Court cases that relate to tribal sovereignty and how that affects uh, safety for Native women. So um, I just, just real quick, and then we'll get into the actual substance of the CLE. Uh, again, I could talk for hours about all the amazing things that Lori Smith Camp did, but one thing that I think just is something that so few other federal judges will would ever be able to say is that when I was clerking for her, she gave me permission to write a play um, on the 100 and, and perform it in the courthouse on the 130th anniversary of the trial of Chief Standing Bear. And so we did that, worked with the Ponca tribe, specifically uh, Chairman Larry Wright, and brought in folks to perform the play in the courthouse on May 12, 2009, the 130th anniversary. Well, after that, she worked to get the play to the Smithsonian. And because of her efforts and her advocacy, this play came to the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, and Justice Sotomayor came and gave the most beautiful speech at Judge Smith Camp's invitation. And, you know, I think it just says so much about her, no matter where she went, she was a diplomat for justice. She was a storyteller. She, she brought people from different communities and different lives all together for, for the same cause, for just sharing stories in the interest of justice. And so I just wanted to share a couple. This is, um, you'll see here, um, this is uh, Kevin Gover, the director of the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian, Judge Smith Camp. You'll see Justice Sotomayor, Lewis Hedman, an honored elder of the Ponca tribe of Oklahoma, who was playing Chief Standing Bear in the play. And then two of the Ponca princesses at the time who are leading, they were, the tribe was performing, or the, the, the drum group really was performing an honor song and the tribe was honoring uh, Judge Smith Camp as well as Justice Sotomayor. It was a very special night and I, um, 
again, I just think it, it just shows some of the best characteristics of Judge Smith Camp. And this is uh, at the time, at that time, so when I first started working with the tribe, uh, Larry Wright was the chairman and then uh, it became Becky White was the chairwoman. And so here she's honoring Justice, uh, well, just somewhere in the background, but the forefront, you see she's honoring Judge Smith Camp. And I just wanted to share that. So now for my actual presentation that Judge Smith Camp uh, asked me to give before we lost her. Um, she specifically asked me to tell this story. And of course, it's every legal case has a story. Every case has facts. My family happened to be front and central to a huge case in the Supreme Court in 1832. And that's relevant today because a lot of folks are asking, what are the after effects everyone's talked about or thought about McGirt? Maybe you've read Justice Gorsuch's opinion, maybe you haven't. But I want to just take us back to the 1830s and, and my tribe, Cherokee Nation, we're different than Creek Nation. And let's be very clear, McGirt is about Creek Nation, not Cherokee Nation. But I'm looking at the Supreme Court as an institution of governance that has a unique relationship with tribal nations. Why is that? Well, uh, when I was a little girl, my grandmother would sit me down and she had this painting here of John Ridge hanging on her wall. And she would take us, me and my sister, to this cemetery right here. And she would show us their graves, John Ridge and Major Ridge. And she would say, John Ridge is your great, great, great grandfather. He was the first native attorney in the history of the United States, the first native to become an attorney. And even though he was an attorney and he could write briefs, they wouldn't let him argue in a court. Because of course, if you were a native attorney, then you couldn't argue in a court. But he worked with Cherokee Nation, who hired William Wirt, the former um, Attorney General under John Adams, to argue their case in 1832 in Worcester v. Georgia in front of the Supreme Court. And at a time when the executive branch of the federal government and the legislative branch were seeking to exterminate us, it was, I say executive and legislative, I hope so, it was the judiciary that recognized our inherent right to exist and our sovereignty. And I just, I just think too, that makes me think of Judge Smith Camp because it didn't matter what the political spectrum was, whether it was a progressive or conservative issue, she was a member of the judiciary and she really understood what that meant and what that meant to uphold the constitution, regardless of party politics of any side, this versus that. And I think that that's um, something that sometimes is, is lost today. And I just, again, I just, I, she's a leader for us all. But back to the presentation I'm giving. So, um, why is this significant? Well, you have to understand that the high rates of violence against Native women, today Native women do face the highest rates of violence in the country. But this didn't start from nowhere. This has been happening for generations. In my great, 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 great grandfather's time in the 1820s, Major Ridge, John Ridge's father, he was the speaker of our tribal council in 1825 when he passed a resolution that made it illegal to rape a Cherokee woman on Cherokee Nation lands. And when they did so, they made that law applicable to any person. It did not matter if you were a citizen of Cherokee Nation or not. It did not matter if you were a citizen of France or the United States or Georgia or Creek Nation or Seminole Nation. If you came on the Cherokee Nation lands and you raped a woman, you would be prosecuted by Cherokee Nation. Now, this law was put to test in 1832 in the Supreme Court. Why and how? Well, the state of Georgia was trying to remove us from our lands. And part of those efforts were to destroy the legitimacy of our government and say, we as a tribal nation cannot exercise jurisdiction over our lands. That was one strategy for removing us, right? One way they did that was they passed a series of laws, uh, multiple, they outlawed our government and they made it illegal for our government to operate within our headquarters, which is bizarre and absurd and unlawful. Of course, they didn't have the authority to do that. They did it anyways. They also, the state of Georgia, passed a law making it illegal for any non-native American citizen to enter into Cherokee Nation lands without permission from the Georgia governor. You had to sign an oath that you would uphold the laws of Georgia and not the laws of Cherokee Nation or any tribal nation. Well, a reverend, Reverend Wooster, refused to do that. And so he entered Cherokee Nation lands and actually lived there and helped uh, translate the Bible into Cherokee, helped uh, start the Cherokee printing press and the Cherokee newspaper, which, as you can imagine, was a major reason why uh, the state of Georgia wanted to remove him. So they arrested him, imprisoned him, and this case went on the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, no, 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 state of Georgia, you have no jurisdiction here. Cherokee Nation has jurisdiction. We have several treaties with them. These treaties mean what they say. And if you actually look at that case, it's not that different than the wording in McGirt. Now, what we have in between 1832 and 2020 is very different. 
right? And so you can really see McGirt as a restoration of what Chief Justice Marshall wrote in Worcester v. Georgia. And it's a case that's near and dear to me because it is a case that my great, great, great grandfather, the very first native attorney in the history of the United States worked on directly. Okay, so now let's, what does sovereignty actually mean, right? When I toss out this word sovereignty. Well, sovereignty is inherent and it's pre-constitutional. Tribal sovereignty didn't start in 1776. It didn't start in 1884. It didn't start in 2020. It's always existed, right? Our nations have always existed. Tribal sovereignty today in terms of a legal formality is observed in the United States Constitution. It's observed in treaties that tribal nations have signed with the United States, which the Constitution tells us are the supreme law of the land. It's also recognized in congressional legislation, multiple examples, um, including the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act in 2013. It's also recognized in judicial decisions in the United States Supreme Court. For instance, uh, the decision in McGirt from 2020, as well as the decision in Worcester v. Georgia. It's also acknowledged in administrative practice. So if you look at decisions coming from many federal agencies, but more often than not the Department of Interior and other federal agencies that have um, DOJ and others that have a lot of uh, experience and, and responsibilities in Indian country, you will see that in their work, they also recognize sovereignty. Uh, so tribal sovereignty has sort of ebbed and flowed over time, right? Like I talked about, we have this, this pinnacle in 1832 and 2020, but we have a giant dip in between, right? And um, what comes with that is if you look at history and you look at the moments where either the Supreme Court or Congress or the executive branch of government, because it's gone back and forth, um, when you look, when laws are passed or executive orders are issued that diminish tribal sovereignty, you can draw direct links to health, safety and welfare outcomes, income outcomes, poverty, violence. You can see the effects that, that the outcomes in Indian country. So I'd like to talk to you about Oliphant, which is one of those negative outcomes. So Oliphant happened in 1978. Now, again, if you look back to 1832, you have the Supreme Court saying, no, Georgia, you have no jurisdiction over Indians or non-Indians within the borders of Cherokee Nation. You know why? Cherokee Nation is the only sovereign that can exercise criminal jurisdiction within Cherokee Nation's borders. Fast forward to 1978, and the Supreme Court does a complete reversal and says, actually, Tribes have no criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians within their borders. There's no, I mean, good luck to all, you know, all the academics that have tried to square these two decisions. It's actually impossible doctrinally. But um, as we know, no human institution is perfect. And I, you know, happen to honestly believe this is a flawed decision. I think there are many that agree with that. But you, one thing you have to understand about this decision in 1978 is that it actually cites to Johnson v. McIntosh. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, Johnson v. McIntosh is an 1823 decision where the Supreme Court said that tribal nations cannot claim legal title to their lands because they're racially inferior savages and heathens. Those words are actually in that 1823 decision, and that decision has never been overturned by the Supreme Court. Like I said, the Supreme Court is like any human institution, right? We've got great decisions that we celebrate that really remind us what what our vision of justice is in the United States, democracy, the values in our U.S. Constitution. And then there are those decisions where, okay, Indians don't have rights because they're racially inferior savages and heathens. I think very few Americans today would feel comfortable with that kind of doctrinal foundation. The problem, however, is that that case has never been overturned, and that is what the Supreme Court cited. That is what Chief Rehnquist cited in Oliphant in 1978 when tribes uh, – lost their criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. So we have a lot of work to do as Native women advocates, as tribal advocates to restore this tribal sovereignty. Why? It's had life and death consequences. And I'm, I'm probably getting close to, I have, <laughs> the great thing about pre-recording these is that there's no one to tell me to stop talking. But um, this has a lot of information and I'm sure uh, the OBA can share it. Um, one of the things I'm really going to focus on is the, the impacts on safety and crime rates and violence. And so what's happened is when you remove tribal jurisdiction over non-Indians, you've created a situation where as a Native woman, if I'm living on my reservation, in my home, in my community, and if I'm assaulted by a non-Indian, the closest government to me, my government, cannot 
arrest and process, does not have the jurisdiction to arrest and prosecute that perpetrator. Imagine if we told the state of Colorado, when Ted Bundy came into Colorado and, and raped and murdered those girls, you did not have, you do not have jurisdiction to prosecute him. You know why? He's not a citizen of Colorado. That would be absurd. No one's going to go to Kansas and say, you don't get to prosecute anyone who comes within Kansas borders and rapes or kills one of your women citizens unless they're a citizen of Kansas. And if they're not a citizen of Kansas, there's nothing you can do. But that is what Oliphant did. And so that's what we have to undo. And these are just some more general broad examples of how Congress has shifted from the 1800s of being sort of that branch of the US federal government that was stripping tribal sovereignty, where the Supreme Court was upholding it. Now in the 1900s, we've seen a little bit of a flip and we're seeing Congress start to restore the tribal sovereignty it took away in the 1800s and the court doing a reversal. Now in the 21st century, we've got McGirt authored by Justice Gorsuch. So it, it's, you know, I tell law students who are studying Indian law who get dizzy and, and get multiple headaches because <laughs> The doctrine is just all over the place and, and Judge Smith Camp and I had multiple conversations about this because, you know, she worked very hard on her Indian law cases, but it is challenging um, because it's just, it's, it does vacillate. I think we have to be honest with ourselves and as an advocate for tribal sovereignty, I am very hopeful with Justice Gorsuch's opinion in 2020 in McGirt that we're, we're heading back in the right direction now. But here's just a few examples of some of the acts that have restored sovereignty. And, and we're ending here with the Violence Against Women Act of 2013, which reaffirmed tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit acts of domestic violence or dating violence against Indians. So I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, Native women do face the highest rates of sexual assault. The DOJ, uh, the Department of Justice, has reported that the majority of violent crimes committed against Native victims are committed by non-Indians. Now, that's not to say that folks in our own communities don't commit violent crimes. That does happen. But the reality is, is that because of the Supreme Court's decision in Oliphant, our tribal nations are without the jurisdiction to prosecute the majority of violent crimes against our women and children. That is the number one cause, a major factor, if not the number one cause, as to why we have such incredibly high rates of murder, sexual assault, and rape in our communities. And it is a crisis. Thankfully, in 2013, Congress worked to restore a piece of the jurisdiction that Oliphant took away. And so this is one of my favorite photos, um, because on the left, you will see uh, Diane Millich, who is Southern Ute. And then next to her, you will see Deborah Parker from Tulalip. These two amazing Native women survivors were invited to the signing ceremony in 2013 when the president signed this reauthorization of VAWA with the restoration of tribal criminal jurisdiction to, uh, to the signing ceremony. And uh, it, I got to attend that event. It was an incredibly powerful event. Again, it was like watching Wooster v. Georgia or McGirt as Native folks were just so used to being told, no, your nation doesn't have the right to protect you. And here was this powerful moment where for, for the first time in my life, we were watching the United States restore tribal sovereignty. So because of our 2013, uh, we don't have a complete Oliphant fix, right? There's not a complete, um, restoration of that jurisdiction. And if you read the last line in Justice Rehnquist's opinion, he says, you know, clearly this is within the constitutional authority that Congress has. Um, so if, if these tribes do have this jurisdiction, then it's up to Congress to decide that. And that was in 1978. Finally, in 2013, Congress acted and they restored these jurisdiction of these three categories. But let me tell you, as an advocate who works for um, victims of sexual assault in tribal communities, one of the biggest problems we have is what if we have a non-native stepfather beating the wife and, and raping the child? I'm sorry, we don't have jurisdiction now to prosecute the rapes against the child. We can put him to j in jail for beating his Indian wife, but we can't do anything about the fact that he's uh, abused this child. The tribal government can't do anything. Now, the federal government might have jurisdiction, um, that getting them to prosecute a case is a, is a whole other matter, right? And we really appreciate our U.S. attorneys and all the hard work they do. But at the end of the day, that's no substitute for the right of a Native woman or a Native child to be protected by his or her own government. These are the key stipulations. And again, I will let folks uh, read through this because I think I probably am getting close to being um, over my 20 minutes that I think I have. But um, you'll see here that this is the language from the statute from 25 U.S.C. 1304. Um, now, I just want to say a few words about what happened in the McGirt case, which just came out because Judge Smith Camp did ask me to also speak about that. Um, 
So what was at issue? Well, it was a criminal law case, but really what was at issue was whether or not Creek Nation still had a reservation. If Creek Nation still had their reservation, which no one disputed until the end. This is one of those really interesting examples of if you read all the briefs where Oklahoma did change their argument. Initially, they were like, yes, there was a reservation, but Congress disestablished it, or they meant to, even though they didn't use the right words. And then by the end of the McGirt argument, they were saying, well, actually, there never was a reservation because blah, blah, blah. But it's very clear when you read the Treaty, treaty of 1866, and as Justice Gorsuch wrote, the Treaty of 1866 clearly recognized a reservation for Muscogee Creek Nation. Now the question is, is did Congress ever disestablish it? Under the Solemn v. Bartlett test, if Congress did not disestablish it, then the reservation still exists because Congress is the only branch of the federal government that has the authority to disestablish a reservation created by treaty. So Oklahoma was arguing for a reversal of the applicable present precedent. And you, you folks may remember the Nebraska v. Parker case, which uh, Justice Thomas wrote was an eight to zero decision. It was a very clear application of the Solemn v. Bartlett test. And honestly, I think for a lot of us Indian law practitioners, we really didn't see the difference in the facts, circumstances, and the law um, between Nebraska v. Parker and, um, and McGirt. But that's basically what this case was, even though um, Nebraska v. Parker didn't implicate criminal law issues. It had to do with other um, issues uh, more in terms of some civil jurisdiction and authority, but uh, this case, of course, related to the exercise of criminal jurisdiction. And so uh, Creek Nation asserted that its reservation had never been disestablished. Um, I did author, along with Sarah Deer, who's another presenter as a part of this uh, CLE, uh, a brief that we filed on behalf of the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. And what we pointed out is that if courts were to judicially disestablish reservations, that actually undermine the implementation of VAWA 2013, because in doing that, in, in restoring these categories of jurisdiction in 2013, Congress limited that restoration to crimes committed in Indian country. Legal term of art, a lot of you may be familiar with it since Nebraska does have Indian country under um, 1151, 18 USC 1151. But one of those categories of Indian country jurisdiction is a reservation. All of a sudden, if you lose your reservation, then in order to exercise this restored VAWA tribal criminal jurisdiction for dating violence or crimes of domestic violence, the tribal police would have to ask the Native woman victim when she calls, what is the legal status of your land? If that land is not held in trust or restricted, then the tribe will not have jurisdiction, even though Congress passed VAWA restoring that jurisdiction. Why? Because you'll be on a disestablished reservation on fee land. And VAWA doesn't restore tribal criminal jurisdiction in that setting. So it could have devastating impacts for Native women who rely on their tribal governments to protect them. And that was the message we sent to Congress, or not to, sorry, to the court in filing our amicus brief in McGirt. This is uh, the quote from Justice Gorsuch in McGirt. Uh, he started off with the famous quote, on the far end of the Trail of Tears was a promise. And at the end, uh, it's a great quote. I'll let everyone read it for themselves. But one of, at the end of this paragraph, he writes, today we are asked whether the land these treaties promised remains an Indian reservation for purposes of federal criminal law. Because Congress has not said otherwise, we hold the government to its word. Powerful words. Uh, I do note that Sarah Deer and I um, recently published an article in the uh, George Washington University Law Review that sort of discusses the implications and of how McGirt will affect safety for Native women. Bottom line is it leaves Native women more safe, safer, because their government is able to protect them when non-Indians commit crimes of domestic violence and dating violence within the nation's borders. And uh, of course, we're working as advocates to hopefully restore additional categories of criminal jurisdiction to ensure that when non-Indians commit crimes like abuse against Native children on tribal lands, um, tribal governments are able to prosecute those crimes as well. Um, and so that's it. Um, this is actually a photo of when uh, some of us were outside the Supreme Court front steps for the Dollar General oral argument in December 2015. And that was another amazing victory. Of course, that was a tie. That was after Justice Scalia's passing. Uh, so thank you so much for letting me talk about these critical issues of sovereignty and safety for Native women and how they all tie together. And um, thank you again um, to Judge Smith Camp for all that you gave me in shaping who I am today, making me who I am today and um, you will be remembered. Wado.
thank you so much, everyone. I, I appreciate it. Greetings, everyone. My name is Sarah Deer, and I am here today to share with you information about the Power Act. Thank you very much for having me, and thanks for all that you do to make victims safer in your community. Today I'll be covering three major topics. The first is the Power Act, what it is and what it stands for. The second is the role of pro bono attorneys for victims of violence, particularly uh, victims from tribal communities. And then I'll end with giving you a summary of some of the great national resources that are available to help you do your pro bono work. So the Power Act is a bipartisan piece of legislation that passed in 2018. It stands for Pro Bono Work to Empower and Represent Act of 2018. The purpose of the law is to promote pro bono legal services for survivors of domestic violence. The law is quite short. It actually has more findings than directives, but there are some significant findings that Congress put in the bill, uh, basically including things like the extremely high rates of domestic violence, the unmet legal needs of victims of violence, the studies that show victims of violence can get better help with legal assistance, and the role of judges in encouraging pro bono services. And that's where we come in. So one of the directives is to require every federal district um, to host public events regarding domestic violence and pro bono services and specialized programs in districts that have Indian country territory. So that's what we're doing today. The other part of the bill requires the judges to uh, report annually on the programs to support pro bono work, as well as an assessment on the effectiveness of the public programs, like the one you're watching now. So let's dive right in. There is clearly a need, an unmet need, for skilled legal representation for do domestic violence victims. Studies show that legal services are second only to medical services as the most requested need of victims. And most women who report needing legal services don't get it. And I think that this statistic in particular helps us understand why Congress passed the Power Act. How can we stimulate a strong, robust pro bono practice to support victims of domestic violence? The other thing we know from studies is that when victims are represented by counsel, they tend to do much better. So even though technically a survivor could apply for a protection order in most jurisdictions without an attorney, those that are represented end up getting better legal protection from the courts. When we talk about the Native communities in particular, we're certainly talking about poverty, which is a tremendous barrier to uh, assessing and receiving a correct legal representation. A median household income for Native people is significantly lower than the average median household income as a whole. In particular, Native people are more likely to experience problems with employment, housing, law enforcement, healthcare, and education as a result of the poverty they experience. And as I said, it's clear from studies that domestic violence survivors with attorneys receive greater legal protection from the courts than those without. We also know that domestic violence survivors without attorneys have a higher risk of revictimization. And receiving civil legal services does not just um, help the victims with their legal problems, but can drastically decrease levels of depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. This is because some of these legal issues tend to exacerbate existing challenges that folks have faced from being victims. Now, one of the um, uh, questions that people ask a lot is, well, I'm not really an attorney that does that. And so, can you know, I don't do domestic violence. I'm a tax attorney. Um, but there is a need for many different kinds of volunteers to help out with these cases. Litigators, obviously, uh, are great, but we also need policy attorneys. We need people who are new attorneys, uh, experienced attorneys, retired attorneys. There is a role to play. It may be a small role. Maybe you represent one victim or one organization, but that effort is going to make a huge difference in the lives of victims. The other thing that we tend to focus on when we talk about domestic violence is the criminal justice system or the civil protection order system. But there are many other areas of law where victims need support. 
So the most obvious, I said, is civil protection orders and divorce and child custody. But we also have victims that have immigration issues, that are dealing with disabilities, that have racked up consumer debt in part because of the victimization. Victims of violence also sometimes need employment law help because they have missed work due to being a victim. Some victims need housing assistance because they've lost rental housing due to the violence. There are a wide variety of types of legal assistance that victims of domestic violence need that are not limited to what we normally think of as the you know, initial needs like civil protection orders and assistance as a victim in the criminal process. And it's not just limited to direct representation. If you're not comfortable taking on a client who is you know, needing direct legal representation, there are other ways that you can help. You can, for example, help a battered women's shelter get a contract with a security system if you're a contract attorney, right? You can do um, community education and outreach, meeting with other attorneys, encouraging them to get involved. Um, sometimes there's appellate work that needs to be done if a, if a um, court case hasn't ended in a, in a uh, victim's favor, there may be a need to do an appellate uh, brief in a case. Mentoring other volunteers, helping uh, advocates, the people with, you know, doing the direct services with victims, helping train them on how to identify the specific legal needs of the people that they are serving. I think it's helpful to know when some of these issues are in the public eye because this is an opportunity for you as an attorney to help out with a particular legal problem. Um, many shelters programs and other kinds of victim service programs um, celebrate or I guess commemorate would be a better word, commemorate um, certain months where they work on public education. So this is a list of some of the most common um, awareness months. We have a stalking awareness month in January. Um, we also talk about dating violence in February. And oftentimes we don't remember that teens and people who are not in a marriage relationship also experience domestic violence. We have a sexual assault awareness month in April, victim rights week in April. We have an elder abuse awareness day every June. In October is domestic violence awareness month. And that's why I think this, uh, this event today that we're um, developing for you um, is in conjunction with our awareness about domestic violence. And we also have a Celebrate Pro Bono Week here in October, which is just an opportunity for the legal profession to support one another through pro bono work. So I wanna tell you about some of the resources that are available to you, many free of charge, that will help you represent um, or provide advice to domestic violence victims. Um, even if you are not comfortable at first with doing these kinds of cases, there is a huge network of national organizations that train attorneys every single day and provide free resources for many of them. So I wanna walk you through some of the ones that I think are the most important. So I'm gonna to start today with the National Crime Victim Bar Association. You can find them online at victimbar.org. Now, the Crime Victim Bar Association is a typical bar association. There is a payment for membership. Uh, they do have some waivers for new attorneys and student attorneys, but they are an attorney referral service. Uh, and so when victims contact them, they put them in touch with somebody who is willing to represent them um, through their network. They also provide online um, training, civil justice seminars, and of course, most training as this one is going online. So you don't have to travel to get this training. You can join their webinars or reach out to them individually with questions that you might have about representing victims in court. So they are not a tribal specific organization, but I've worked with them enough to know that they realize the limits of their knowledge. They have um, a really good understanding of tribal jurisdiction, um, but they, they may be able to put you in touch with um, a, an attorney who's been regularly representing native victims in tribal courts to help you uh, learn the ropes or to perfect your skills. The Legal Resource Center on Violence Against Women, uh, available at lrcvaw.org, is an organization I sit on the board for. 
And they saw when this organization was created, they noticed that one of the biggest challenges for attorneys was dealing with interstate custody issues for victims of domestic violence. In other words, with a victim who might flee to another jurisdiction for safety and then has to figure out uh, how to handle the child custody case uh, with their abuser. So they've created this organization that basically focuses almost exclusively on interstate custody cases where the mother or the father is a victim of domestic violence. Now they are not experts in tribal jurisdiction, but they do maintain a network of attorneys who are trained to practice in tribal courts who may be able to help you sort out a, um, a custody case that involves interstate or intertribal uh, questions with, child, uh, with, with the children of victims. Um, they are available, again, free for attorneys. They do free training online. Um, and uh, I can't say enough good things about this particular niche, which they identified as being a particular unmet need because, of course, these interstate custody challenges can be very, very um, time consuming. Uh, so I can't highly recommend them enough. Another non-native organization is the Victim Rights Law Center. They're at victimrights.org. Now this organization is unique because it focuses on civil remedies for survivors of sexual assault. And certainly there is a lot of crossover between uh, sexual assault and domestic violence, but almost all of the pro bono efforts have been focused on domestic violence. We often don't think about sexual assault victims as needing civil legal representation. Um, so what this organization does is it focuses on things like housing, employment, privacy laws, immigration, right? So let's say you have a victim of sexual assault who needs to break her lease because she was assaulted in the apartment. Um, victim Rights Law Center has, has done this um, dozens of times, has helped victims of sexual assault um, get out of leases or um, hold on to a job or be able to move safely. They have free training and resources for attorneys. They do some direct representation, um, but by and large, what they are is a national resource center for attorneys that are representing these victims. In terms of appellate work, the Domestic Violence Legal Empowerment and Appeals Project um, is a newer organization that works almost solely on appellate matters. So they assist with legal appeals of unjust rulings in family violence cases, and they're particularly interested in impact litigation. Their website has an extensive online library with training materials and publications to help you deal with an appellate case that arises in a domestic violence pro bono um, relationship. The National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women is an organization that's been around for quite some time. Their sole role is to assist defense attorneys when you have cases where a person who has been a victim of domestic violence has been arrested, convicted, or is currently incarcerated as a result of a crime they committed in self-defense. Now, they do not do direct representation. They are a resource for you. They provide national training and technical assistance to attorneys who are representing these victims, and uh, this assistance is free. They also have a brief bank, they have pleadings, a pleadings library, they have a, a tremendous number of resources at your disposal. You don't have to recreate the wheel. They've been doing this for decades. Then I wanna to turn to the ABA Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence. This is an amazing part of the American Bar Association. The commission has been around for quite some time provides training for attorneys that are representing victims, free technical assistance, and again, like the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women, have a pleadings database and a brief bank. And you can contact them and they can put you in touch with other attorneys who've been working on similar issues and share with you some of the resources from their, their own uh, library in terms of developing your own cases in tribal or state court. The ABA has a couple of really important handbooks I wanted to let you know about. They are available for purchase at the ABA website. Uh, the Civil Law Manual is an extensive guidebook for protection orders and family law cases in cases of domestic violence. 
provides a great deal of insight um, and it's it's designed for beginners so even if you're not somebody who has regularly represented victims this is a great resource for you to get started um, they also have a more specific uh, impact of domestic violence on your legal practice manual which is also available for purchase this manual goes through a variety of different practice areas including tax law um, torts, uh, criminal justice, there's a variety of different practice areas. And each practice area includes extensive information about how victims of domestic violence need your help. You're a tax attorney, how can you help? This is a manual that will help you understand how you can be part of a pro bono effort to address victims, even if this is not your primary area of law. Now I'll turn to some of the tribal specific resources that, that are available to you. Um, the first thing that I wanna talk about is the Strong Hearts Native Helpline. Now, most of you probably know that there's a national domestic violence hotline that connects survivors to their local service providers. What we found over the years is that very few Native women were calling that number for assistance. Uh, I think because of the concern that, you know, I have specific issues that are really unique to being a, a tribal citizen or living on tribal land, and I'm not sure that the national hotline, the sort of mainstream hotline, is going to provide uh, what I need from them. And so the Strong Hearts Native Helpline was developed, a specific hotline for victims of domestic violence and sexual assault who are Native, both people on reservations and off. Now, it's currently still um, gearing up to a 24-hour service. Right now, it has pretty extensive hours, but I think they're still filling some staff positions um, so that they can go full-time 24 hours. What's nice about hotlines today, especially for younger folks, is they have the hotline, the old school, you know, telephone hotline, but they're now providing advocacy and support through online chats, um, both on the website and through uh, apps. This can be really important, again, for younger victims who may be more comfortable with the text um, method of receiving support, but everything is available at strongheartshelpline.org, and um, you can refer victims to, to this resource. They have 24, like I said, almost 24 hour now, um, um, moral support, emotional support, resources, uh, and they are also starting to do some training, and most of that, again, because of COVID, is online. So again, if you're looking to uh, fill up your bookmarks um, on your web browser, I definitely include this one as a resource to give survivors, but also an organization that can prov provide uh, some training and resources to you. I used to work at the Tribal Law and Policy Institute before I became a professor. Um, I can't say <laughs> enough good things about these folks. TLPI.org. Uh, everything um, that the Tribal Law and Policy Institute creates as a result of federal grants is made available for free online. And so all of the resources that TLPI has developed can be found online. This includes um, manuals on how to improve tribal laws on domestic violence. So it's, again, one of the unique ways that a pro bono attorney could get involved with these issues, even if they're not doing direct representation. It's really helpful if tribal governments are trying to improve their laws and improve criminal laws, protection order laws, that you can um, have free legal counsel to, to review the development of those laws. So one of the things that TLPI has is manuals on drafting tribal statutory law goes step by step through, you know, starting all the way with your purposes and your findings all the way to the um, end result of, of a case. Um, and so if you're helping out a tribe or a tribal program, um, they're free resources. Uh, there's new resources on developing specialized tribal domestic violence dockets. Uh, this is developed a, a, as a result of requests from the field to figure out how to streamline a tribal response to domestic violence through specialized dockets. So there's brand new training materials on that. Public Law 280, there's a number of resources about Public Law 280 um, that will help you understand if you're in a Public Law 280 state, what that means and how it's going to affect victims. 
Another resource that we developed several years ago is a compendium of tribal court decisions and orders related to domestic violence. So one of the things that happens a lot in tribal practice is that you may be a case of first impression, especially in the appellate setting. So if you lose a case at the lower court and you appeal on behalf of a victim, sometimes there's not a very big body of case law available from that tribe. Like, you, like I said, you may be a case of first impression. And most tribal courts, you know, they are not required um, certainly to um, look at state or federal law as binding precedent. Uh, it's only persuasive precedent. Um, but sometimes tribal judges are interested in what other tribes have done. And to that end, um, we've provided a, a document which contains a, a numerous um, tribal court decisions uh, and rulings about domestic violence in tribal courts. So this manual would give you an opportunity to see what other tribal courts have ruled on different domestic violence issues and then use that as, again, not binding but persuasive uh, precedent in your uh, appellate case. Another issue that comes up time and time again is full faith and credit for protection orders. Um, this has been in VAWA since 1994, but I, every day I still hear of jurisdictions where this is not happening. Uh, tribal court orders should be given full faith and credit by state officials and vice versa. There's really no ambiguity in what federal law says. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of catching up to do in terms of educating the field. Uh, law enforcement officers need this training, um, but also uh, tribal prosecutors and state prosecutors. So there are free resources on the full faith and credit provisions of the Violence Against Women Act and how it plays out with tribal courts. The National Indigenous Women's Resource Center at NIWRC.org is a national organization addressing domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, uh, sex trafficking, um, mostly in Indian country, but really for, for all tribal people, no matter where they live. Um, they are not a direct pro bono service provider, but they do have, again, numerous webinars, trainings, and free resources on their website. So if you're just getting, if you're brand new to, to the issue and you've not represented a Native person before, um, I highly recommend checking out their website. <clears throat> they have a number of links to other organizations, um, really serve as a clearinghouse, uh, national clearinghouse for, for these issues. One of the newer national organization that's available to you is the Alliance of Tribal Coalitions to End Violence. Now, this is an organization that was created as, as, uh, out of a need. There are many different state tribal coalitions uh, on domestic violence and sexual assault. So there's one in Oklahoma. There's, um, you know, there's one in Oregon. There, there are a variety of different states that have um, a, a tribal domestic violence sexual assault coalition. There's a need to organize and um, provide some umbrella sort of administrative oversight and support for tribal coalitions, and that's where this organization comes in. Um, one of the really exciting things that I've seen come out of this organization is the development of advocate certification. So typically, um, in the state court systems anyway, in order to have privileged communications um, with a survivor such that the advocate cannot be subpoenaed uh, to testify, there's a requirement of 40 hours of training. Again, that may depend on the particular state. But what a lot of tribal advocates found is that that training was really not relevant um, to, to working with tribal uh, citizens and communities. And so what the Alliance is trying to do is develop a specific um, advocate certification that will meet that need to have that privileged communication, but that certification training is done by Native people for Native people. So again, um, that's just getting up and, and getting started right now, but a tremendous resource um, for potentially down the road when you're working with an advocacy program uh, that is concerned about privileged communications. So lots of uh, resources there. So I really just wanted to give you a sense of, you know, none of this is starting from scratch. There's been a lot of work done um, that you don't have to recreate. You can use templates, pleadings libraries, briefing libraries, training materials, webinars, all archived on these free websites. 
In fact, I think of all of the organizations that I've put in this presentation, um, the only one that requires any payment at all is the National Crime Victim Bar Association, and that's um, somewhere around $300, $325 a year. Uh, and, and that is the only one that I am aware of, of all of these that does charge um, for membership. So you have, um, you know, you have a tremendous amount of free assistance and consultations with organizations that have been there, done that, and are willing and able and excited to help you help victims. So my name again is Sarah Deer. I'm a professor at the University of Kansas. I'm a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma, and I'd be really happy to field any questions um, or suggestions. And you can reach me by email right now because of COVID. I do not have an office number. If you'd like to chat, just send me an email. We can set up a time to talk. Again, it's a real honor to be invited to participate in this Power Act event. I wish I was there in person. I know we all wish we were there in person, but I can't thank you enough for what you do. Um, your work, whether you're doing this on a daily basis or once or twice a year, it is saving lives. And I, I don't think that we give our pro bono attorneys enough credit for what they're doing. It may seem like a simple protection order case or a child custody case, but you are saving lives through the work that you do. It's a real honor to be invited. I'm excited to have been part of this. And I urge you, um, if you have any questions at all that you think I can help answer, please do not hesitate to reach out. Osio, Giga Gay Kamama Tawaton, Jalagi Gaysa, Yonega Gaysa, Kirby Williams, G Jalagi, Wado. Hello, my name is Kirby Williams, and I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, and I am currently the Outreach Coordinator for the Native American Program with Legal Aid of Nebraska. In this segment, we'll be talking with representatives from each of Nebraska's four tribal domestic violence programs to give a look into some of the obstacles and challenges that each face in addressing violence in their communities and accessing services for Native American survivors. Before that, we wanted to take this opportunity to give some context to the issue at hand of violence against the Native American community and talk about some of the current resources available while highlighting some of the areas in which we still need assistance. So to start, I think it's important to ground ourselves in the to this topic by asking the question, well, how did we get here? How did we get to a point in which we're discussing violence in the Native American community in 2020? Why is this happening and why is something that's been taking place for over 500 years continuing to impact this group today? And so to answer that, I first want to take us back to before colonization, before 1492 and Western European contact, before that guy got lost on a boat and talk about how we as tribes traditionally operated before this. Now, I wanna be very clear that I am speaking generally for most tribes, but not all tribes, as I certainly don't speak on behalf of all tribes. But what we find is that with most tribes prior to contact, there was this inherent balance between men and women and tribal members based on mutual respect and responsibility. Everyone working together for the betterment of the tribe as a whole. We see that women are respected and valued leaders in the tribe, that they are considered sacred due to their likeness to the earth. So much in the way the earth nurtures and sustains our lives, women have that same gift, and that is something that is to be protected and to be honored. We know that our two spirit individuals hold a sacred role and are protected and honored. For those of you who may not be aware of the term two spirit, just to give a very brief definition, um, this is more of a modern term that we use to describe a gender identity. So much that today someone may identify with a gender identity or sexuality from LGBT, for LGBTQIA plus individuals, there were different roles and identities and interpretations of how these individuals presented from tribe to tribe. But the important fact is that these individuals held important leadership and ceremonial roles, and again, were to be protected and honored. And so now that's not to say that we lived in this perfect utopia where violence never occurred. Um, it did, but it didn't occur nearly in the rates we see nowadays, which we'll touch on here in a moment. And what we see is that when violence did occur, it was handled very differently. So first and foremost, when a survivor came forward, that survivor was believed, they were supported, they were consulted on what needed to happen to help with their healing and what kind of punishment should be handed down to their perpetrators such as something like a repayment or some form of restitution, um, even being banished or ostracized from the tribe. 
And violent men were seen as being incapable of being leaders. If you couldn't control yourself, if you couldn't protect our tribal people and our women, you had no business making decisions on behalf of the tribe. Little different than how we see it handled nowadays sometimes. So post 1492, we have increased Western European contact and we start to see this shift in balance. And so there's a story that a lot of tribes have in which it generally goes that when tribal people were first meeting with Western European colonizers, the tribes would look around and say to the colonizers, well, where are your women? And the colonizers being all men would occasionally just laugh at them. Oh my God, why would we bring our women? Our women are nothing, our women are property. They don't make decisions. So we see this huge difference between this Western European patriarchal mentality versus the tribal mentality of balance between individuals and our men and women. And so colonizers recognize this, that there is this power that tribes place in their women and their two-spirit individuals and that we hold our people as sacred. And so this is where we start to see rape and violence being used against native people and especially native women as tools of colonization in this effort to quote unquote, conquer tribal populations. And so it's important to point out that this is nothing new for tribal communities. Native people and especially native women have been raped, bought, sold, kidnapped, traded and exploited since the time of European colonization, since 1492, since that guy got lost on a boat. You're just now kind of hearing about this. And so in an effort to try and stop this violence, we start to see the assimilation of tribal people and we see the adoption of Western European patriarchal societal norms and getting rid of our traditional tribal practices. So we start to see the shift where we start to see women no longer being valued as leaders or holding property or things like that. And we continue to see these practices throughout time when it comes to US federal policy in relation to the quote unquote Indian problem. And we see this in several distinct eras of policy. We see the era of removal, where the US government forcibly removed tribes from their homelands. This is how my tribe was taken from our original homelands in Tennessee, Georgia, and the Carolinas area to Oklahoma. We see the era of reservation. We see the era of assimilation, which is where the boarding school era came out of, operating under the federal policies to quote unquote, kill the Indian, save the man. And the era of termination, this is actually what happened to the Ponca tribe of Nebraska. They were terminated as a federally recognized tribe and were not re-recognized until 1990. And they had been working tirelessly to get back a lot of what they lost. Currently, we are in the era of self-determination. This is where we've seen legislation passed like the Indian Child Welfare Act, the Indian Civil Rights Act, Indian Self-Determination Act, and the Indian Religious Freedoms Act. Hypothetically, we have more freedoms today to be who we are as indigenous peoples than before, but that's not to say that everything is settled, resolved, or perfect. There are still groups and people who seek to assimilate us and undermine our tribal sovereignty. So there are still fights happening to try and preserve our culture, honor our tribal governments, and protect our people. And so if you're sitting there and you're thinking, wow, this has been happening for 500 years, that has got to take a toll. And you would be correct. So this concept of the impact of this cumulative emotional and psychological wounding across lifespans and generations, all emanating in this massive group trauma is a concept known as historical trauma. It's how this historical context continues to impact native people and other marginalized groups throughout time and even today. And we continue to see violence and trauma inflicted against native people. Things like targeted legislation to undermine and eliminate tribal sovereignty, high rates of suicide and poverty and substance abuse and violence. This is all embedded in, in historical trauma. And so we'll take a moment to look at the current context when it comes to intimate partner violence, which we're focusing on today. So we know that more than four in five natives, both women and men, will experience some form of violence in their lifetime. 56% of Native women will experience violence in a given year, and 55% of Native women experience rape or violence by an intimate partner. Almost half of Native women who experience violence in their lifetime have been victims of stalking, which is particularly concerning given the high prevalence rate of stalking as an indicator or precursor to intimate partner homicides. Native Americans are also considered to be a vulnerable population to be trafficked, especially young Native women and girls which is attributed to factors such as the fetishism of Native women, the fracking industry's man camps demand, and the link between the high disproportionality rate of Native children in the foster care system. 
And so with this, two things that I think are important to note with this is that Native Americans are two and a half times as likely to experience violent crimes, which is more than any other race or ethnicity group in the United States. Additionally, that the perpetrators, abusers, rapists, traffickers, you name it, are actually not Native the majority of time in the majority of cases, which is a very important distinction when addressing this violence in the Native community. Coinciding with all of these crimes is that they are feeding into this additional issue and crisis, which we is known as the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples Crisis, also known as MMIP. And you may have heard this as MMIWG or MMIW or MMIR, and can be a reference to the awareness movement that Native people consistently raise awareness for. But the National Day of Awareness is May 5th to honor Hannah Harris, who was a Northern Cheyenne uh, young woman and mother who went missing and was subsequently found to have been murdered. There is a data crisis on our hands. So the reality of the matter is we don't have a great idea of how many of our indigenous relatives are actually missing. And this is due to things like poor record keeping, racial misclassification, and other problems. So for instance, the National Crime Information Center reported over 5,700 cases of MMIWG in 2016. NamUs, the National Persons Missing Database, only logged 116 of those cases. So we have a huge gap in just trying to track this crisis. And it's important to note that Nebraska is not immune to this crisis. In a study released in late 2018 by the Urban Indian Health Institute, they studied 506 unique MMIWG cases across 71 US cities. And what they found was that the state of Nebraska ranks seventh in the top 10 US states for the highest number of MMIWG cases. And the city of Omaha, Nebraska, where I currently live, ranked eighth in the top 10 US cities for the highest number of MMIWG cases. So this is a crisis that is extremely relevant and hits home for those of us here in Nebraska. And so as I wrap up, I want to draw from and paraphrase a bit from this quote, which was part of a study um, known as the Garden of Truth study in which Minnesota Indigenous women's groups conducted interviews with 105 Native women who had been trafficked for sex or prostituted. And the reason I include this is because I think it does a really good job of encapsulating exactly the issues and contributing factors at hand. And I also highly recommend checking the study out to give you a better understanding. So to paraphrase and give the larger context, the people who are marginalized because of colonialism's devastating historical impact, because of their lack of opportunities in education, because of race and ethnic discrimination, poverty, Previous physical and emotional harm and abandonment are the people who are most often exploited. People who have the fewest real choices available to them are those who are most often exploited. The critical question to ask with respect to the women that this study interviewed is not, did she consent, but has she been offered the real choice to exist without this? I wanna thank you all for joining us today. Um, to end my section, I wanna highlight uh, some of the relevant resources for Native survivors of violence in Nebraska. Here are all of the phone numbers and links to the Nebraska Tribal Domestic Violence Programs, along with the Strong Hearts Native Helpline, a culturally relevant national hotline, which is available to Native survivors of violence to get anonymous help. And then there is Legal Aid of Nebraska. So we are a statewide nonprofit law firm providing free legal service to people who typically don't have access to an attorney. And we do this in an effort to promote better access to equal justice. Within that is our Native American program, which serves enrolled or enrollment eligible Native Americans throughout the state of Nebraska with civil legal matters in state, tribal, and federal court. And we are able to handle some criminal matters in tribal court only. Within our Native American program is our domestic violence initiative. Throughout this project, uh, we raise awareness and promote prevention of domestic violence, sexual assault, dating violence, human trafficking, and stalking against Native Americans in Nebraska, while also providing legal services to survivors of those crimes in legal matters pertaining to their victimization. So for instance, legal matters such as filing a protection order, assisting with obtaining a divorce or custody of children when fleeing an abusive situation, ensuring safe housing and other related matters. And while we do the best we can to provide free service to as many Native survivors as possible, we recognize that as a nonprofit, we are not able to assist everyone, whether due to a conflict of interest, caseload, or other circumstance. 
In fact, in many of the tribal courts in Nebraska, there's typically only 10 or so attorneys licensed in tribal court, further limiting Native survivors' access to legal services. That is why we wanted to participate in the promotion of more pro bono legal services through this event. Because the more services available to survivors, even outside of our own, the higher the likelihood that we can increase independence and safety for Native survivors, resulting in safer communities overall. We appreciate your participation and willingness to support Native survivors of violence. If you have any questions or are looking for further resources to assist Native survivors of violence, or looking to receive more training or information for your staff, please feel free to reach out via my contact information here. Again, we appreciate your participation and look forward to working with you all in the future. Wado, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, do you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about um, your position? Sure. Um, my name is Dorsey Carnes. I'm the DV sexual assault advocate here in Winnebago at our Winnebago shelter. I've been here as an advocate for seven years. Oh uh, yeah, my name is Dana Yunker. Um, I'm the, it's a long title, Domestic Violence Sexual Assault Family Support Program Coordinator. Um, and I've been in my position for approximately two years. My name is Jenna Kalong. I am part of the domestic violence program with the Ponca Tribe in Nebraska. I work specifically with elders. I'm their elder victim advocate in the Lincoln office. I'm Andrea Rodriguez. I'm the domestic violence program director for the Ponca Tribe based out of Norfolk, Nebraska. And I've been the director for 18 years here. And I'm looking forward to sharing um, how the impact of victimization impacts our Native American clients. Uh, my name is John Penn. I'm an enrolled member of the Omaha Tribe in Nebraska, and I'm currently working at home due to the pandemic as a grant writer. Uh, but I've been a social worker for over 30 years and spent a lot of my time developing programs, including domestic violence, family violence, um, and most recently a family resource center in Macy, uh, Nebraska, that focuses on services concerning the effects of trauma. What effects does violence have on Native Americans and tribal communities? All right, um, I'll start here. So we are seeing a lot of trauma due to the violence that our clients see. Um, the impact not only impacts themselves, but there's a secondary impact of the children, grandchildren, relatives, household members um, due to the abuse, um, depending on that, if that's domestic violence, elder victimization, um, child sexual abuse that we see. Um, the impact also has uh, economic impact. Sometimes our clients aren't able to work. They have, um, when they leave, they have uh, duties of single parents where they have to figure out daycare, transportation to their jobs, um, different appointments that their children have. Um, they have to work around preparing for court, um, trying to find legal representation, and making sure all the needs of themselves and their children are met. Um, a lot of times the children have behavioral problems at school. Um, And the other, um, another unmet need could be not wanting to verbalize or get the help that they need um, to heal from the trauma. Um, Jenica, do you have anything to add on the elder perspective? Yeah, I think um, specifically from the elder perspective, um, you know, just personal experience, a lot of the clients that I work with who are elder um, unfortunately, the abuse are coming from family members or somebody close to them, caregivers. Um, so there's a lot of guilt involved with it. Um, that's how their perpetrator continues the abuse of, you know, you're my mom, you know, so you have to put up with me or I'm this way because of you. 
or grandchildren or nieces, nephews, whatever the case is. So there's a lot of guilt that keeps them in that cycle of abuse. And they actually don't even think that they're getting abused because they believe that. They believe that guilt trip. Um, and, you know, I think that can go across the board um, with all um, abuse victims, no matter what their age is. And I think, you know, the impact that I see that is happening to victims, and it can not even be for survivors too, you know, when they're first starting out on their journey, is that they have low self-esteem. Um, they don't think that they can do anything. They don't have the, the, um, the know-how to help themselves to be self-sufficient. Um, and because of that low self-esteem self that their perpetrator put on them, you know, they can turn to different substance abuses, which then puts them on a longer road to being, um, feeling more comfortable with their new status as a survivor. So those substance abuses can come in. Um, and then along with that, you know, not being able to keep a job or go to school to be self-sufficient to provide for themselves and start to heal. I think a lot of it goes back to historical trauma. Um, and, you know, because we lost a lot of our, our culture and our language and, um, you know, you're taught how to talk to people, you know, because um, they had that authority when they had the, uh, you know, the boarding schools, um, stuff like that. But I feel um, it has a tre tremendous effect because there's a lot of like lack of services, lack of funding. Um, a lot of times like law enforcement's understaffed and underfunded. Um, and same as like our department right now, we, there's just myself and we have one advocate. So um, it's really hard for us to keep up at times. And um, I think, you know, it, it does have a tremendous effect on children for one. Um, you know, it's very traumatizing. And a lot of times, you know, there's kids that, that don't remember it having or happen but they tend to have, you know, like PTSD, um, they develop behaviors. Um, and, you know, it just, in the Native American community, we're really um, very close, you know, close knit, like family, like everybody's family. And it tends to, to break that bond, the, those family bonds. So. I think the effect that violence have here is that we don't have a lot of um, opportunities to put our women somewhere and we have to use what's around here. And it makes it hard because everybody knows everybody here and where, we're, where we are located at, um, our, one of the housing districts is right next door. And as soon as we pull up, um, they're looking out the window, okay, who are they bringing in? You know, there's no privacy whatsoever. And that's kind of devastating to our women. Um, the other effect, you know, it has on, uh, on them is our court system. Um, a lot of it don't go to court. Just a few cases do. It either gets dropped, they get um, intimidated, like, I was just talking to one client today and that's what's happening. And we get the runaround down at court by somebody that's supposed to be helping us. And they're literally saying kind of mean things to our women. And, you know, and it's the process starts all over again. And it just makes me really frustrated. Well, I think that over the years I've witnessed firsthand the devastation um, of domestic violence. I'm um, a firm believer that violence in the community and in our homes has contributed to high incidences of um, um, child abuse, uh, substance abuse, um, 
a lot of ongoing trauma. Um, as a generational problem, it, it's caused severe breaking up of families and lots of unresolved trauma and grief among um, victims, both adults and, and, and children, including the children who have witnessed such uh, violence and who experience the chaos that it brings in the families. Um, I also think that violence is a, uh, a learned behavior that is brought on by um, the perpetrators who have an unhealthy need for control. Um, I've worked with many perpetrators and I believe that um, their abuse stems from uh, a lot of unresolved anger that started with that when they were young and uh, the experiences they had growing up. Um, and this has led to the generational abuse among our families. What are some challenges survivors of violence face when it comes to accessing legal representation? And what impact does it have when survivors can access legal representation? I, I, think, I think, first of all, I want to make a statement that, you know, national statistics show that um, Native women suffer from domestic violence at a higher rate than any other group of women. I think that's well documented and our reservation is no different. Um, we have experienced high rates of violence against our women for, for many generations. Uh, and even prior to the coronavirus, um, the issues surrounding violence against women included barriers that made life difficult for victims of abuse, uh, our extreme poverty and um, lack of education and employment opportunities have greatly hindered uh, victims from leaving abusive relationships. Um, with the arrival of coronavirus, um, the suffering and distress has often increased dramatically as our women are often uh, trapped by the circumstances outside their own control. And so that's a real concern that we have right now. It's a concern that I have right now. All of our tribal systems and services are pretty much shut down. And so um, we're obviously very concerned about those victims who, um, at least before, were able to receive direct services. Those services aren't available right now. So that's a real big concern. I wanted to make sure that people understood that and knew that. Um, the, the mandated lockdowns and quarantines have uh, uh, presented these um, uh, challenges for victims um, that, that advocates have never faced before. Um, um, our social services uh, for victims and um, domestic violence has suffered severe budget cuts um, and, or as I said have been shut down completely and, and, and even though um, some telehealth services have been offered few women have access to a computer or the privacy needed to participate in services and that includes legal services. Um, the pandemic has also made it more difficult for victims to leave abusive situations as employment is often um, um, been severed and resources to leave are just not available. A lot of our victims who were working and, and are not receiving a paycheck right now, they're vulnerable. They're even more vulnerable now because they, they, they don't have the ability to save up money to leave um, situations that, that are becoming very, very abusive and dangerous. <clears throat> And, and in some instances, even um, the fear of contacting the virus has kept um, um, a lot of victims from seeking medical care um, after experiencing physical abuse. So, um, but other barriers and challenges, um, uh, I, I think overall, uh, in speaking of our reservation, uh, survivors of abuse lack support from our community um, in, in general. Um, the tribe currently lacks the resources to meet um, many of the challenges, uh, even when they face overwhelming situations um, on their own or with limited or no resources to meet the daily needs or the needs of their children. Um, we need, as a community, we need to improve our community awareness uh, of the complexity and occurrence of family violence and the subsequent trauma it produces. And more importantly, as well as the need to better inform the community of the avail availability of services and how to access them. Um, in addition, effective uh, 
community-based prevention measures and awareness activities are important elements of combating family violence. And without access to those right now, it just uh, makes the problem even worse. We more utilize legal aid, you know, legal aid of Nebraska. So you guys are, are a tremendous help to us, but I know that um, that there can be some conflicts at times, you know, like if the other party contacts you, especially when it comes to like divorce or child custody matters when there's domestic violence involved. Um, you know, a lot of times there's protocols and policies that you guys have that, that sometimes can make it difficult um, for the parties involved, especially like the victims. Um, but I do know that, that you guys do have your own program now and um, that you guys have a lot of great resources. And so um, like the, besides your program, I've like, about the only thing I could think of is like referring people to like the state bar, Nebraska mm -hmm. State Bar, you know, association and looking up for pro bono lawyers and things like that. Um, another thing I feel that makes it difficult because a lot of times there's tribal politics. Um, sometimes, um, like from experience, I've had where. Uh, in my past, I was in a domestic violence situation and we were in um, going through divorce and I was going through a custody battle. And I actually um, sought out Legal Aid of Nebraska uh, and they did assist me. However, um, like the tribe tried to get involved in the civil matter, even though that it wasn't um, in center. So I, it was out of out of the off the reservation and so e even when it comes to um like law enforcement and stuff like that it, it makes it difficult when you have family members or they have family members that are you know so close with law enforcement and then it makes it hard for them you know i think just like reporting sometimes things don't get handled properly because of family ties. And depending on what family you belong to, you know, things like that. I think that um, the ones that have seeked out legal assistance were more likely to follow through, more likely to follow through with protection orders and the, you know, the divorce and the custody. And I think it's, it's more so because they have more support and I really like how you guys have your Native American program. So, you know, they feel really comfortable about that. Um, a lot of, you know, support and things like that. So that's kind of like what I see. Well, I think it was helpful. They didn't go through legal, the ones that my success stories were, but the women that did go through and they got the, the ladies themselves, they're still in hiding because the aftermath of them going to court and the families coming back and doing or saying things to them, that's again, small community, you know? It sounds like we need more of like an understanding in the community. We need more of that sort of, when you can have people who understand and can represent that in court even to just express what's going on and why they need that support yeah yeah because one of my my girls she she doesn't come here to Winnebago she stays off the reservation just because of the situation yeah and that's so that's sad because we need to be with our communities and our families and yeah that's right yeah and she just comes around at night time when nobody can see in the car or whatever. All right, so some of the things we have noticed with our clients throughout the years is, um, first of all, they have no funding at all to pay for a private attorney. Um, the other thing we've noticed is uh, when they want to use legal aid, there is sometimes a conflict where uh, legal aid has either represented them in the past on a different matter, so they're not able to represent them, 
on this um, situation or the abuser has already contacted legal, legal aid, so they're not able to use them. Um, sometimes we have also seen that when they try to get um, pro bono help or legal aid representation, um, legal aid has a large caseload now, and especially with COVID-19. Um, and sometimes they need immediate help and the pro bono or legal aid attorneys aren't able to um, staff their case yet that day. They might have to wait till um, Friday of that week, for instance, to be able to give them an answer whether they're able to take them on. Um, other uh, concerns are that they don't trust um, the, the criminal justice system um, or they're not familiar with how to proceed. Um, so that can be an issue that we have seen too. Yeah, I think um, as an advocate working with victims and survivors, um, one of the things that I run into all the time is the, you know, my client doesn't, doesn't trust the legal system. So it's very hard for them to be motivated to do anything about their abuse. Um, you know, I was, I was, I always say this when people ask me, um, all, all my clients, a hundred percent of my clients, if they have the option, will always do tribal court. And I think it's because they feel more comfortable that it's in tribal court. Um, they've expressed to me that they feel like they're not heard in non-tribal court settings um, just because they don't know if they're being stereotyped or if their perpetrator is a family member of theirs, that they're not taken seriously about their abuse. Um, so they just feel way more comfortable doing it in tribal court if they can. And I think that's something that if it is criminal, then they would have to go to county or, you know, different courts. It wouldn't be able to be in tribal court with Ponca. So that gets them really, really nervous. And I think that's kind of um, a boundary that they come up with quite often that they can't um, feel comfortable in tribal court, that they would have to use a different type of court system and they don't feel like they would get a fair shot at having their voice heard. Well, I think that first and foremost, um, my thoughts are that, that um, I would like to see a lot more um, victims um, access legal services, but it begins with a choice. And for, for the, a lot of the barriers that I talked about and challenges I talked about earlier stand in the way of being able to make a good solid choice of receiving legal services and to take the steps necessary to protect themselves and their children and to make changes in their lives. Um, they worry about uh, confidentiality. They worry about having a safe, uh, a, a place where they feel safe to be able to talk about what's going on in their life. And I think very much the, the legal services and the um, support services go hand in hand, especially the counseling services. Because the more the, that um, pre predominantly are women um, who are victims, um, make that courageous step to make a change in their life. And the more that they um, are able to access and are willing to access um, treatment and recovery services, the more apt they're able to be able to access the legal services that um, your organization provides and, and, and um, access other ones that we may be able to get to them. Well, thank you guys so much for doing this. Um, is there anything else you guys want to share as we wrap up today? Legal Aid, um, the staff there understand the issues that Native Americans face. They are experienced in tribal law, Indian law. Um, they're familiar with the tribal court process. And like Jenica said, all of our clients would prefer to utilize tribal court. They're a little bit more familiar with that process than a typical state um, or county court system. Um, and just how welcoming specifically legal aid staff are um, in building a rapport with our clients um, is very important.
I think um, what I see is like a little bit of a confidence boost when they actually have a lawyer that they don't have to go represent themselves. You can see kind of a sigh of, of relief and me too. <laughs> Cause you know, when I accompany to the, the court, if they don't have a lawyer, it, it is kind of intimidating and scary and you don't, you might not know all the legal language. And I, I could definitely understand that, that relief that they feel when they do have a lawyer with them. Um, you know, they can tell their lawyer and their lawyer can put it in legal language for them. And, you know, they don't necessarily have to, like with tribal court, you know, or any court, you know, if you're representing yourself, you might have to question the perpetrator, you know, ask questions. And they, that's something that they don't enjoy doing. And I completely understand. So when they have that legal representation that they can do that for them, it's a confidence boost, most definitely. And you can see that once that is established, that some of the other things that they're feeling insecure about kind of go away. That's something that really, really impacts them in a positive way. Um, so very grateful for legal aid or, you know, any type of legal representation that they can get because you can see how much of a relief that is for them. Which more attorneys to um, be familiar with tribal court and um, if they could work with our tribal court administrator in getting signed up to be a on the list for attorneys that can represent on in tribal court that would be great yeah um finding legal representation pro bono or not is very difficult um, for clients and um the importance of it if they do have to take their case to court for whatever reason um you know they should feel confident and comfortable because it's already a scary situation. And, you know, having more representation would be great. Um, I know that that's kind of a kickoff start for some people um, because survivors and victims sometimes struggle with follow through with any aspect in their life. So, you know, they can't follow through with a job or, you know, daycare or whatever their situation might be. And I think it really is stemming from the abuse. It is. And it, it, when they have their voice heard in any type of situation, court situation also, that kind of gives them a boost to self-esteem that they're starting to do follow through with other aspects of their life from what I've seen. Um, so, you know, having your voice heard is something that really is a boost of self-esteem for people. So, you know, I would love to see more legal representation um, for the Native American community. I think the women, just like a call I got today, and she told me that she wasn't comfortable with one of the other advocates. And she asked me, you know, can you take my case? And I'm like, sure, you know, but I think the most, most that uh, um, they're looking for is someone to sympathize with them and understand and, you know, share that heartfelt understanding and that we care about you. Because if you don't have that, then they're not going to call or, you know what I mean, want to talk to you. I think that's the biggest and have a lot of support behind you and other resources to give them. That's probably the best. I want to thank you and, and your organization and including us in all the wonderful services that you provide to our people and that um, coming down and, and to our reservation and making that trek on a regular basis is not easy. And um, uh, I just really appreciate all the work that your organization does and, and the assistance that you give to our people.